Very well, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Barbara Buchner and I'm the Global Managing Director of Climate Policy Initiative, but also the Executive Director of its Climate Finance Program. It's a great honor to be here today with all of you. I will be your moderator today and I would like to start by welcoming you to this brainstorming lab for partnerships for climate finance and a green recovery. I would very much like to thank the organizers of this session, especially the Euroclima Plus program of the European Union with, with its implementing agencies, GIZ and AFD, as well as the Latin American Investment Facility and the Caribbean Investment Facility, also European Union programs. I also would like to thank the European Investment Bank, the European Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, and the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, for their contributions. And with that, I'm going to switch uh, hats now. I'm going to ask for control here uh, and actually uh, going to get us started a little bit with an initial uh, presentation that really hopefully will give you a little bit of inspiration for our discussions today. Great. So we are all here today to really brainstorm new ways on how the financial sector can close the investment gap and promote green recovery in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's a daunting effort, not just at national levels, but it requires a whole system transformation from local action to global coordination. Many say it simply cannot be done with the short amount of the time that we have, but I disagree. As humans have a pretty good uh, track record of doing things that the majority say simply cannot be done. And I'll give you some examples. Let me start with a Latin American one. A canal in Central America to connect the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans was originally proposed in the late 1800s. Many said it couldn't be done. Between the French and the US, it took 30 years and cost $610 million back then. That's around $15 billion in today's dollar currency. It cut Trans-American Oceanic travel by five months and today serves over 12,000 ships per year, operating profitably for the people of Panama and a crucial part of the global supply chain. Well, let's just hope Petanka doesn't get stuck in that one. We go to the next slide. In the mid-1980s, a group of genetic scientists proposed to map the entire human genome. Many said it couldn't be done. Scientists across three continents worked for 13 years at a cost of roughly $6 billion in today's currency. The Human Genome Project has produced incalculable advances in medical science, including our ability to produce multiple highly effective COVID-19 vaccines in less than a year's time. Another, another feat that many said couldn't be done. And the final example I'd like to leave you with um, is the effort to put humans on the moon. That effort cost the US government about $25.8 billion over the 1960s. That's about $260 billion in today's dollars. And when adjusted in the context of the over economy, the price tag would skyrocket to about $640 billion US dollars. Again, many said it couldn't be done or it wasn't worth the price tag. The Apollo effort, along with other government programs, spawned an unprecedented wave of U.S. technology advancements, including the birth of Silicon Valley that produced tens of trillions of dollars on return in that investment. And so here we are today with the largest uh, challenge of our time, if not of all human history. I pursue this work passionately because I believe it can be done. And like the other examples that I showed you, I believe the investment will bring significant opportunities that will benefit us for generations. And while there are many unknowns, we need to move quickly. I will give you now a few concrete examples of action that we can take today to reach our goals. My organization, Climate Policy Initiative, we are experts on climate finance and on climate policy. We help governments, financial institutions, and businesses to drive economic growth while addressing climate change. And we are best known for our work in tracking sustainable investment trends in identifying innovative business models and supporting the policy and finance solutions 
that help scale the transition to an inclusive, sustainable net zero economy. On this slide, you can see one of our flagship products, the so-called spaghetti diagram from the latest edition of our global landscape of climate finance report, which provides the most comprehensive overview of global climate related primary investment along its life cycle. While we found that annual tracked global climate finance crossed for the first time the half trillion US dollar mark, reflecting steady increases in financing across nearly all types of investors, we know that we're still falling far short of what is needed to achieve global climate and sustainable development goals. Latin America and the Caribbean in particular is expected to be one of the regions most severely impacted by climate change. But the region is also crucial because of, size, of its size and the resources to the global efforts to address climate change and to enable a net zero world. Out of the 579 billion US dollars that are highlighted in this graph, 37 billion or about 6% reach Latin America and the Caribbean. That's perhaps on par with the region's over a percent of global GDP, but it's not representative of the need for a region that is 40% of the world's biodiversity, 50% of our tropical forests, and is crucial to the global climate stability and the global food supply chains. And without ramping up climate investment significantly, emerging market regions like this one are set to account for most of the continued rise in emissions over the coming decades. So we need system-wide structural changes and immediate action to reach them. To be effective, our action must not only be urgent, but also ambitious, innovative, and collaborative. But luckily, this is not just a problem. This is also a tremendous opportunity. Pursuing a low carbon sustainable growth path could actually result in global GDP, economic and social benefits exceeding 26 trillion US dollars by 2030. First business as usual, which will accelerate global warming, will likely cause significant drops in global GDP and significant increases in social disruption and harm, such as reduced life expectancy, mass migration, deeper income inequality, and increased political unrest. According to the Inter-American Development Bank, if we invest now in the transition to more sustainable practices, over the next decade, a net 15 million jobs would be created across renewable energy, sustainable agriculture, and other green sectors. Another positive sign is that despite the major impact of the pandemic, the economic outlook for Latin America and the Caribbean is expected to improve this year. After regional GDP declined by 6.7% in 2020, the region is expected to grow by 4.4% in 2021. Colombia, Brazil, and Mexico all included clean growth as specific allocation in their recovery efforts. Chile announced that 30% of the additional resources for public investment under its COVID-19 recovery plan will be used for sustainable and green projects. And these are smart public investments building on a pre-pandemic trend that placed Latin America as one of the top destinations for foreign direct investment in renewable energy, with Chile being cited by Bloomberg New Energy Finance as the most attractive country globally for renewable energy investment. Well, well, congratulations, Chile. Well done. But let me close with some of the overarching recommendations that I have, because I am bullish on the opportunities, but I'm concerned about the speed which is uh, why we are here today to brainstorm to really think how we can accelerate that. We need to redouble efforts toward laying a path for a more sustainable, inclusive, and resilient LAC region. And for a while now, I've been reinforcing three key success factors for scaling up sustainable finance and increasing ambition, particularly as we are building back or, or building forward better from the pandemic. So let me briefly share those uh, with you. And let me just put them all on the I think first, I want to make sure that uh, I really share what, what I truly believe in. I do think government policies should lead the way. We are seeing very clearly that good policies are key to resourcing a sustainable and resilient recovery. Great fiscal policies like carbon pricing or reforming fossil fuel subsidies and green budgeting can be important elements in the government's COVID-19 response toolkit. Why? By such approaches, remove inefficiencies in public expenditures while raising additional revenues and at the same time align recovery planning 
these climate objectives. They also send a strong signal about the investment potential of a country. Chile's success that I just mentioned is credited in part on its government's renewable energy leadership, well-established clean energy policies, full renewable energy and coal decommissioning targets and over a commitment to greening its grid. Second, we need to use public and development finance wisely to unlock private capital and increase impact. Even more clear in the wake of COVID that public finance is essential, but limited resources in the region must be deployed for catalytic impact. Even though I cited some positive examples of green recovery efforts earlier, almost all governments are still providing tax cuts and bailouts for to polluting industries such as coal mining and coal-based electricity and supporting fossil fuel subsidies. This is not a good recipe for success, putting those public investments at risk of being stranded, diminishing the appetite for foreign investment and extending longer term negative impacts of fossil fuels such as pollution. So we really need government investment to push the boundaries and foster innovation, to unlock investment, particularly for the sectors such as adaptation and the other harder ones and for geographies that are harder to tackle and to unlock the private sector. But it's not just the sovereigns that need to reframe their investment priorities. Development finance institutions in particular have a major role to play through country-led policy dialogues and collaboration with the private sector. Expanding their role in the post-COVID recovery is likely one of the cheapest and lowest risk ways to finance climate action, building amongst others on their experience with innovative financial instruments. And finally, we must shift the entire financial system. This is a moment in which all financial actors need to align their portfolios and their counterparts' portfolios with a better future. Mainstream is the need of the day, and at the heart of this work is the need for transparency and better data. And there's the need to have better accountability and integrity of the existing and emerging commitments at the announcement. But all that cannot happen on its own. All this cannot happen without partnerships. And that is why today's session is so important. Here is the participation of governments, of development banks, of international cooperation institutions, financial institutions, representatives of civil society. We seek to contribute these innovative ideas to respond to this challenge. So I went into that much detail to reinforce that the ambitions we should all have for the remainder of this forum and in the lead up to this very important COP26 later in the year, they're not dreams that simply cannot be done. The science is clear. If you don't act swiftly and ambitiously, the continuing increase in global temperature rise will cause economic and social damage that future generations simply won't be able to afford to address. We must insist on sustainable net zero goals and develop science-based transition targets and pathways for each step along the way. Those next steps are clear. We must agree upon and deploy disclosure and tracking systems for governments, for financial institutions and business to follow those steps with integrity. Policies must be put in place to enforce those agreements and enable the environments for businesses, investors to support our climate goals. And to me, the history is clear. When we put our minds and our hearts to the task, we can do what many say now is impossible. So I look very much forward to working with all of you on what we know is possible. And uh, with that, I thank you all. And I'm going to switch back um, hats to the moderator and I'm going to hand back the control to uh, our colleagues in the production. Okay. So with that, I would like uh, you now to invite you to, to click on the slider link that you will be receiving in the chat and answer the following questions uh, to get us all started on to start gathering your input. Do you consider to be the main barriers to closing the climate investment gaps? Okay, so please um, help us understand your perspectives and please submit your, your thinking on these questions here. What are the main barriers to close the climate investment gap? Okay. 
clearly has an emerging theme around the lack of incentives or like the need for more incentives. But I think there's another theme around also the costs um, and uh, stranded assets, which is basically that the cost of, of investments in on the fossil fuel side. See another another bucket around communication or knowledge certainly is important to make sure that everyone has the information they need in order to make informed dis discussions. And I see another another addition to that, the transparency, measurability, and data. Apparently, I see then another need for um, more institutional improvements. Uh, I think also improvement in, in the regulation, decision making, plus another bucket around private sector. I'm very curious to see the red cloud around all this. Um, underlying all that, I think, is the public private partnerships to really making sure that there is a dialogue, that there is collaboration across the financial um, system. There's another component of certainly the pipeline and making sure that there is a pipeline of bankable projects and a pipeline of bankable projects that is also attractive to the private sector. And I think I've, we've seen some, some contributions on really having um, concern about the incentives for a business model that is attractive to the, uh, to the um, private sector. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks so much for all of that. Uh, we can assure you that we're going to, to to summarize all the all the input we get from you and like kind of report back to you after that as well and include that in the summary of this um, of today's um, brainstorm lab. Again, I think some additional some additional points around really that the lack of green financial products or incentives, business models, financial instruments in the same context. Very good. Well, I think with that, um, unless the organizers tell me something um, else, um, I will um, continue to in, invite you to, to add your thoughts as I'm explaining a little bit the objectives and the dynamics of today's session. Uh, so for today's session, we will start with a case study of a featured country in Latin America that in, and the Camille Caribbean, which has some climate goals and at the same time faces some uh, some real barriers uh, to mobilizing climate finance. So we will then split into three breakout groups where different aspects of this case study will be addressed, supported by guiding questions and with the guidance of three excellence facilitators that we have with us today. And again, I think many of the issues that you have just shared with us, which you feel are some of the main barriers, are certainly will certainly be covered um, in this breakout session. So in breakout group one, we will have Josulis uh, Samaniego, who is the chief of the Division of the Sustainable Development and Human Settlements of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean. Josulis, it's fantastic to have you here. We have in breakout group two with um, Christine Lang, uh, who will be the facilitator there. Christine is the head of the division for the public sector in Latin America and the Caribbean at the European Investment Bank. Uh, Christine, real pleasure of having you with us today. And last but certainly not least, in breakout group three, we will have Mike Enscott. Uh, Mike is the head of energy, water and mobility at the global programs area and in GIZ, uh, so it's fantastic to have you with us uh, here today, Mike. And finally, after the three breakout groups, we will return to the plenary to report key findings and close the session. So let us now dive into the case study um, itself, and uh, let me maybe just get started uh, to uh, introduce this before I will hand over to our um, distinguished uh, facilitators to kind of go a little bit deeper into what we will be discussing today. So I think I'm just going to wait for a slide that is uh, supposed to be uh, shown, uh, I think, right now. If not, let me maybe just get started with the, with the general uh, introduction of the case study. So we are talking about 
Macondo, which is a country in the Latin America and the Caribbean region, which is facing barriers to aggress finance uh, to meet its climate targets, to access, sorry, finance to meet its climate targets, and at the same time trying to sort out the crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. So under the Paris Agreement, Macondo committed to reducing um, its CO2 emissions by 23% by 2030, uh, compared to emission levels in 2012. And it also committed to becoming a carbon neutral country by 2050. So they estimate the implementation costs uh, of this 23% emission reduction target amounts to about 1.1% of its GDP per year over a 15 year period. So to mobilize these funds, the Macondo government is preparing a climate investment plan, which includes both international and domestic funding, as well as public and private sources. And thanks so much. I think we are now on the first um, introductory a slide uh, of our of our case study Macondo. Again, so you can see here um, we are um, at the sorry, I just got somehow muted. This is the 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 fun technical issues that we're still learning after more than a year. But yes, coming back to my um, our case study here again, the estimated implementation costs of the 33% emission reduction target uh, that Macondo has set it for itself amount to 1.1% of its GDP per year over a 15 year period. So to mobilize these funds, the Macondo government is preparing a climate investment plan looking for both international and domestic funding and both public and private sources. But it faces a number of barriers. Um, first, it has struggled to access international climate finance. In the past, the um, maximum share of um, international climate finance in Macondo's um, uh, funding portfolio has been about 1%, and that's a couple of years ago in 2019. So in the climate investment plan, Macondo is now aiming to reach 4% of international climate finance. The country also struggles to mobilize funding from domestic sources. In 2019, only 0.46% of the national budget was spent on climate change. And in addition, despite the government's efforts to tackle the COVID-19 crisis, the fiscal impact has been significant, highlighting the need for the economic reform to boost green recovery. So the Macondo Climate Investment Plan will build along three structural pillars. First, strengthening policy and financial framework conditions to promote climate investments and green recovery. Second, developing bank of a green project and improving financing options. And third, integrating technical expertise, capacity building and financial cooperation for a strong climate investment pipeline. Again, I think many of the issues that you all have already raised in, in the need to address barriers. So these three pillars will be the topics of the debate in our breakout groups. Uh, but let me now give the floor finally to our facilitators who will give um, a one minute pitch each on the topic of each of the breakout groups so you just get a better understanding of what you will be discussing. Jose Luis, um, it's my pleasure to hand over uh, to you so you have the floor. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you for your presentation. Very good. And as you have seen from the uh, from the case study, it resembles a situation of many countries in Latin America that have three basic missions. One is to increase the, the spending uh, on the national budget on climate change. It's very small. It's, it's a very small fraction that has to, to go from 0 0.4 to something more significant, closer to 1% of the uh, GDP. It has to increase international funding, of course, and, and go from, from 1% to 4%. But it also has to increase domestic funding. And uh, the country has uh, not yet evaluated the cost sector by sector. They know they have to create a, a uh, financial plan. But as Barbara was pointing very interestingly in her presentation, the whole financial system has to be transformed. So the first question is, what is this framework transformation that has to happen within the country to achieve these three missions. And there's, of course, a second question. What do we do and how do we allocate the presently available climate funding? So that is what we're going to discuss in the first breakout group. 
Thank you, Barbara. Back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for very nicely laying out what you're going to discuss there. So with that, it's my pleasure to um, give the floor to Christine. Uh, Christine, please uh, go ahead. And uh, again, I, I think another area that certainly has attracted a lot of attention in the initial submissions from the audience. Um, so please, um, the floor is yours. Great. Well, I hope everyone's ready for a challenge because in, in breakout room two, we have a, a bunch of advisors for the government of Macondo, which are really going to make a difference in terms of leading the way forward. What do they need to look for in order to have bankable projects? What is it that makes the reality on the micro level? So we're going to take the theory of what they want to achieve in NDCs and we're going to try to give them some tips. Uh, it's going to be a bit speed, speed, uh, speed ideas, but we're going to try to come up with some ideas to get them to develop eventual projects and really bring the, the public and the private sector together by creating an enabling environment. So we look forward to session two. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Clearly, clearly a very interesting discussion. And uh, again, having public and private sector in the room will be extremely important together with obviously the advisors from Mark, uh, Mark Hondo. So I'm kind of jealous that you will have them all in your room. But with that, uh, let me hand over to Mike now. And Mike, you have the floor and uh, explaining your your breakout group. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Barbara, I'd like to invite you to join us in breakout group three. Um, as Barbara was saying in her introduction, this session is really about partnerships and we're going to focus on one dimension of such new um, needed partnerships. And that's the one between what we call financial cooperation and that's mainly development banks, international development banks and climate finance. And on the other side, technical cooperation and uh, technical cooperation agencies and the, the, the work they can do. We have a favorable international environment. We have a committed government of Macondo, but still we're missing the, the, uh, um, the ambitious um, investment pipeline for, for climate uh, projects. So uh, the, the question that we're going to discuss in breakout group three is really how do technical uh, cooperation agencies and financial uh, institutions should work better together in future to really come to a, to a fruitful investment pipeline for climate projects. That's going to be the subject of breakout group three. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mike. And the clearly partnerships, we need them to really accelerate action on the ground. So it'll be fantastic to learn more about that. But is that, um, again, certainly three exciting uh, breakout groups. We will now dive right into the discussions there. Each of you has been assigned, pre-assigned to one of these groups, according to your experience in the region. Uh, so we will um, let you know, get started. I'm going to jump between the rooms. Uh, so I'm the lucky one who is going to meet all the Maconda representatives. And then um, we will then return to plenary to, uh, to, to kind of report back uh, our discussion. So enjoy the discussions and bring all your import, your expertise. We really need your help uh, to make sure that Macondo has a, a great and climate investment plan. So with that, uh, let's go into the groups. Good afternoon. This is a group number two. Um, my name is Kristen Lang, and I'll be leading the discussion uh, for this group. Um, it's a bit of like the Harry Potter sorting of which groups we all end up, end up into, but uh, hopefully you all will be ready for the challenge because indeed it is a challenge. I mean, the Macondo they have high pre-pandemic debt. They have a, a low credit rating. They have low fiscal revenues. So there's little fiscal space. So we really need to find a way to try to trigger some sort of transformation for sustainable finance and, and, a, and a green recovery building back better. So we need to help develop bankable projects. Um, in this uh, group, we have uh, 10 uh, advisors that have been appointed um, that will be uh, providing feedback. We have Gisela uh, Campillo who will coordinate the chat. So thank you, Gisela. We have Rodolfo, 
Lazaric, who will be the one going back into the plenary explaining everything. So thank you for assuming this role. So you have to take all of these ideas and try to uh, convey them to the to the others. And then we have Olaya Lombadero, who will be doing the mural uh, tool. So we we thank uh, Olaya for taking that on on board. So let's go back to Macondo. So we have uh, an ambitious climate investment plan. Uh, we know that they're not going to be able to do it through public spending alone, that we need to find a way to uh, the first pillar is the transport sector. So this is the challenge that we have today is trying to find a way to get the electric vehicles, buses, charging stations, try to find a way to take this project forward. Um, the project will be implemented by the Ministry of and environment and energy, which is in charge of monitoring the NDC. So this is the one that has the end. Okay, well, um, welcome back. Thanks so much um, for coming back to the plenary. I, I have been jumping between the different breakout groups and was very impressed by, I think, very, very constructive, very interesting discussion. So I very much look forward to to hearing the, the key insights from all the three groups. So I, I do hope you also had a fantastic thought and um, provoking debate and, and you enjoyed those. Uh, so I'm um, looking forward to really trying to understand a little bit some of them, the main key takeaways, the innovative ideas and experiences that uh, will um, guide um, your work at the World's Mobilizing Climate Finance, but that will also help our friends in Macondo to actually access uh, climate finance. So with that, uh, actually, let me now move to our uh, reporters from our as three groups uh, to share the results of the discussion with you. And so let me first hand over to our first rapporteur, Georgia Michel from AFD, to comment on the main findings of breakup group one, strengthening policy and financial framework conditions to promote climate investment and uh, green recovery. So Georgia, you have the floor. Sorry, we were taking a couple of minutes to to double check the main issues. Um, yes, I'm I'm okay. Go, go ahead, uh, Marjorie. You can mention the 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 three main points um, uh, that Jose Luis highlighted uh, by the end of the um, breakout room number one. Please go ahead. So thank you, Marco. So. As a response to both questions, which framework conditions can help to incentivize climate investments and which fiscal, economic and or financial instruments could be applied to stimulate green recovery and what are the main challenges for increasing climate spending from the national budget? We highlighted like three results. Create awareness, increasing percentage of investments in the national budget to put a floor of at least five, six percent of the GDP, capacity building in SME, SMEs to increase their access to new technology. And we said that financial sector disclose their investment and exposure to climate change risks portfolio. Um, at the end, we add that um, um, it was important to increasing tax system uh, to to be able to finance this climate change, climate the climate investments to increase the climate investments. Uh, Jose Luis, if you want to add some some points, you're welcome. Capacity building plays a big role, both in ministry sectors and the financial system, in order to translate that into concrete action. Um, incentives also play a big role uh, to favor and make more attractive and de-risk uh, climate action investment. And I would say that uh, there's experience in this uh, risk reduction instruments, uh, not so much in risk increase instruments for uh, high carbon footprint investments. And um, I would say that uh, there has to be a movement away from high carbon footprint investments into lower carbon footprint investments. And that has to include both capacity and collaborations. And I would leave it at that. Fantastic. Thank you so much both. And I'm um, certainly very 
very much agree with the overarching findings and, and discussion outcomes from, from your group. So thanks so much for that. And thanks for a very good um, discussion, uh, which I've enjoyed for, for part of the time. But with that, let me now ask um, uh, to uh, hear the main results from breakout group two, developing banks for green projects and improving financing options. And we have Rodolfo Latari from the life team. So Rodolfo, please go ahead. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, so uh, I'll try to be uh, very, very brief. Uh, so for, for the first question, and this is the one related to the bankability, uh, we had an extensive list of, of requirements, but uh, if, uh, if I have to highlight some of them, uh, the participants uh, said that uh, it depends who is going to finance uh, and, and how it's going to be organized the projects in terms of responsibilities that we, we, we will we'll define how, how the bankability is going to be is going to be identified, which which are the main requirements. Um, it's, it's important to have the the right enabling environment, uh, the political backing, uh, commitment with, with the change. It's an important change in terms of technology. It's a challenge for the country, so so it's important to have this commitment uh, from the from the uh, public sector, uh, the right regulatory framework. Uh, Many of the uh, requirements related to to the uh, to the right uh, enabling environment. In terms uh, of responsibilities, the the participants also highlighted the, the 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 importance of having very clear the different roles to play and identifying which institution is going to take the lead to avoid uh, some confusion among the private sector uh, that may uh, make them doubt uh, about about the investment. Uh, and also, it's important to uh, to have clarity on contracting and procurement. Uh, also, was mentioned that it's important to to listen to all the stakeholders, uh, including social actors, professionals. Uh, and then it's also important for bankability to to uh, to have a well de uh, well defined technology, and also to ensure that the capacity is in place uh, uh, before the, the 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 beginning of the of the project. Uh, feasibility, pre-feasibility studies, technical capacities need to be supported uh, to, to start with a solid uh, technical project that is, that is in place for, for successful investment and also for, for attract uh, private, uh, private investors. Uh, related to the second questions, uh, there was a different financial instrument that were mentioned. Uh, some of them were senior debts, green bonds, concessional loans, uh, also financial guarantees. That can play a big role in, in mobilizing domestic finance, uh, and was also mentioned that it was it's important the role uh, of grants and technical assistance uh, support uh, for that uh, that I that I mentioned before that it's important to have in place the right uh, technical capacity uh, and local capability to to provide guarantees to to the uh, to the private sector of, of the bankability of the project of the projects. Thank you. Uh, sorry, and I don't know if Kirsten wants to add something. Sorry. No, just a just a big thank you, uh, and thank you for everyone that participated. And you know, I think we we highlighted the business case that is necessary in order for someone to risk, uh, uh, you know, providing a, a financing for for such a project. So, thank you, Rodolfo. You did a very good job. We were we had we were full of full of ideas, and I think that you know the our advisors. Uh, were well worth the, the, the um, their their fees uh, for the government of Mokondo. So thank you. Thanks so much, and that really really good summary. And certainly uh, all the the points make very much sense. Uh, I certainly have given very good advice to, to the government of Mokondo. But with that, let's go to our third uh, breakout group, and let's hear back from Pablo Rojas from GIZ Euroclima. Pablo, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Barbara. And yes, from our side, we also had a. Uh, a very active group of, of people, a, a lot of ideas. So our two questions, um, the first one was regarding uh, what is needed for the different actors to a better coordination between them and to create a better climate investment pipeline. And the second question was, how can the partnerships between technical cooperation programs and financial institutions support uh, building a climate investment pipeline? So, um, in, in order to, to clarify all the, the elements, we, we had mainly, we had three main ideas. Uh, one area was uh, focused on long-term clarity. So the importance uh, that governments, that um, the institutions have defined and the countries have defined a long-term strategy 
that this long-term strategy is really realistic and it is impact-oriented, and also uh, to be clear on what the climate change goals of the country are, because this long-term clarity and these long-term strategies will give the investors and all the sectors uh, the, the clarity needed to, to achieve a, a better uh, pipeline and a better uh, project uh, structuring. The, the second area was regarding governance institutionality and stakeholders. So the importance about coordination, about having uh, everyone in, in the same table, um, including financial institutions, including regulators, including government, and of course, uh, private sector, but also social uh, society. So how to engage better all the different interests about all the different actors, and how ca can we also uh, have a very strength governance regarding uh, the, the climate financing of the countries. And the third, uh, but not least, uh, of these areas was about a strong pipeline, how to create a strong pipeline, how to uh, build capacities in the countries, and how can financial and technical cooperation work uh, in an integrated manner. And, and here, it was very highlighted by the, by the participants that we need uh, integrated approaches between technical cooperation, technical expertise, capacity building and financial cooperation, that it is very important to access finance. And in order to access finance, we need capacity building uh, for both project developers, but also for in financial intermediaries in order to uh, give uh, green products to, to, to the ones that are needed. So closing the gap between what is needed and, and what we have um, yeah, in, in the different actors. Uh, technical cooperation does make a big difference here. And it is pretty important that the technical cooperation work um, in a specific way and also in a coordinated manner with the financial cooperation. The mutual reliance is also something that um, a lot of participants uh, highlighted in order to obtain a healthy pipeline. And um, lastly, uh, we, we need to, to also continue working on local taxonomies. So we have to be very clear in what is green and what is not green. Uh, and I think this is it for me, and I will give also the opportunity to Mike if he wants to add something. Uh, Pablo, this was an excellent uh, summary. I think there's uh, nothing to add uh, apart from the fact that I also felt, despite the fact that this was a virtual meeting, for the spirit in the room for partnership and collaboration. So thanks to all the colleagues who participated in that lively debate. Thank you, Pablo, for that summary. Very good. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, General. Thank you also for the, the fantastic uh, kind of summaries uh, on uh, in the graphics here, but certainly we will all be enjoying uh, to see. I, I do realize we're already over time. Um, we are supposed to do a, a second uh, slide open question, but I think uh, as we only have a couple of minutes left, I might directly go to the final kind of closing remarks, if that's fine to, to the organizers. Let me just see for a sec here. Yeah, I think I'm I'm going to do that. And again, I have been um okay, Celia says we have still time for the slider. So I might just be starting to summarize as you will be all kind of hopefully supporting uh submitting some additional uh, um information on the second question that you will be seeing in a second. Um it uh, we, you will also see it on, on the chat. So again, what we want to hear from uh, you before we close here it what is the most important insight you're taking away from today's discussion. Again, what have you enjoyed most? And it can be very brief, just like some input from your side, and then we will be uh, able again to kind of make sure also for, for future um, uh, events like this, that we really are kind of taking your input uh, into account and make uh, also these um, events even more uh, more fun and more interactive, even though I do feel it's, it's good. Partnerships, well, that's a good um, key insight, given that that was the, the goal of this event. So partnerships are key for climate action. It's fantastic to see here. Um, that's right. I think also that that is a good, um, it's a good insight that even though there is a, a very, you know, diverse range of actors that we have in today's meeting uh, was um, overarched. Overarching, I also feel it was a very aligned um, lots of alignment on what are the barriers and what are the opportunities um, and then um, certainly some of the key terms that we see here on on the slide already but which have also been come up uh, come up both in the in the barriers before but then also in the discussions are uh, coming back um commitments dialogue 
um, incentives, um, concerted approaches. Uh, another, I think, shout out to the organizers that um, appreciate this interactive discussion and really this, this coming together to, to work together with um, with different stakeholders. But um, we are approaching uh, the end of the, the session now. Uh, again, uh, for, for me, it's been really enjoyed uh, being part of this. And uh, I, I would like to kind of just like take a couple of minutes to, to highlight some of my main find, findings um, and messages from today's discussion. I think, again, going back both to the initial slide, but also to the discussions in the different breakout groups, I think what we still see as main barriers is um, one bucket of lack of awareness, information, knowledge, and familiarity. So really, we need to have a better communication. We need to have also heard like people talk about better MRV systems. I think a second bucket on lack of incentives, certainly a big one. We need to have better enabling environments. So better incentives to policies, but also better, more innovative financial instruments to de-risk and attract the private sector. I think a third bucket around lack of pipeline and bankable projects. And then uh, again, I think there is uh, also some very clear um, requirements around enabling environment that, that can help there and better responsibilities, lack of proper institutional frameworks, uh, but also lack of uh, capacity. I think what was very clear from all the discussions is that there's been no real lack of funding, so no real lack of money in the financial global financial system. I think it's a problem of alignment. How can we make public policies, information, financial instruments and projects institutions coherent to transform the entire finance system. So let me come back to what I said in my opening. I think mainstream is the need of the day, but I think today's uh, discussions have shown that we need to do the mainstreaming in a much more granular way. So, and with much more long-term clarity in place. So I think we need better information. I've heard a lot around having better sector perspectives to create realistic pathways, including better information on how much money is actually flowing to the sectors and, and coming back also to the taxonomy point. We need also better information in terms of pre-feasibility studies to then enabling this pipeline of projects. We need also more effective use of capital. Again, again, the risking is important, but we got to mostly focus on how can we allocate the risks to the most appropriate parties to really make sure that there's clear responsibilities. And then all around that, I think we need to create awareness regarding all the opportunities and the projects. But all this requires clearly good, strong, regulatory frameworks, enabling environments. It requires strengthening capacity and capabilities. Again, here, I think technical uh, assistance and the right technical capacity is key. It does require strengthening collaboration and coordination, I think, across the whole finance um, ecosystem, financial institutions, regulators, public and private financial institutions, but also with civil society and across ministry and within institutions, again, with key responsibilities and all that, I think, will require some integrated approaches. Um, so with that, we have reached, uh, reached the end of this uh, session. Uh, and it's been really fantastic to, to hear from all of you, especially grateful to all of you for engaging in the discussions in the breakout groups and for having uh, joined us today in this brainstorming lab. So let me also thank the facilitators who have been really terrific and have enlightened us with their pitches. Uh, and uh, with all that, let me thank again GIZ, AFD, the Euroclima Plus program, LIFE, and CIF, European Commission, uh, the EIB, IDB, and CIPAL, who have provided a, a really dynamic space of great value that certainly will be a, a great input for our future work on climate finance. And with that, Thank you uh, all again. I um, certainly look forward to continuing to work with you in the future, and I hope you uh, all stay safe and, and uh, we will have a chance to meet each other at some point all in person again. So thanks so much to all of you. And uh, with that, I am going to close um, this session here today and wish you all a wonderful end of your day or beginning of the day, wherever you are. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot, Barbara. Colleagues, nice to nice to yeah. be with you. Nice seeing you, Stefan. So all bye bye.